Okay, so once again, my dog has, my dog has busted in the room like the Kool Aid Man. What flavor of Kool Aid? What flavor? Is yeah. it like fruit punch? Then, Tropical I was going to say punch? vanilla, but there's no such thing. Tropical fruit punch, yes. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by what's going to happen with Halloween candy sales this year. Are we going to have, first of all, are we going to have a Halloween given that it's COVID? As long as we have it outdoors. Yeah, but are people going to want kids coming to their door and are parents going to want their kids taking candy from other people? As long as it's Uh, from babies. Probably just stick it on the outside of the door. Because I, I went to the, the grocery store and they've got all the Halloween candy out. But I just can't imagine it's going gonna, it's gonna to sell this year the way it does normally. Mm. Apparently from a retail standpoint, Halloween is the most lucrative <laughs> buying a, a, a merchandise I would imagine. opportunity for all the holidays. So I'm Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health. And I am here with Dr. Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Chris. Hello. And I am also here with Dr. Don Thea from the Hi Department guys. of Global Health. Hi, guys. So as a reminder, if you could all head over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. That's BU's hub for lifelong learning, where you can find all kinds of interesting stuff. I don't know. What would you guys call the stuff on the Population Health Exchange website? Really interesting. Population health learning programs and tools. And uh, as a reminder, you could also go over to iTunes or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast app is, and you could give us a rating. And especially if you could give us a, a written uh, review, we would love that because we are getting sad because we haven't had any in a few weeks. And uh, those always make our day. So now on to the show. So today in our first segment, that's our Journal Club segment, we're going to look at a study on RSV vaccination, and we'll explain what RSV is when we get to it, but RSV vaccination during pregnancy and infection in the the children. Then in the second part, we're going to talk about attacks on public health workers at the time of COVID, something really upsetting. And then finally, in our Amazing Amusing, we'll get into some things that make us laugh out loud. So segment one. So we're going to talk about an article that looked at the impact of RSV vaccination during pregnancy and the impact on the infants. The study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was titled Respiratory Syncytial Virus Vaccination During Pregnancy and Effects in Infants by first author Shabir Mahdi of Vitz University. And here are the, here, well, there wasn't a lot, but I got one headline from Medscape, which says, Antibody treatment lowers risk of infant RSV. Maternal vaccination test falls short. So referring to two different things there, actually, I believe. But Chris, can you start us off by telling us what this study was about and what they what they found? Yeah. So respiratory syncytial virus is a disease, is, is, is a pathogen that most people have never heard of, but almost everybody is familiar with the disease, which is called bronchiolitis. And, you know, basically any mother or, you know, parents their child will have had this disease before the age of two. It's almost impossible to evolve. It's incredibly contagious and very widespread. And it's a nasty disease. It causes uh, mucus and inflammation of the small airways called the bronchioles. And when those plug up, the kids get all very, very wheezy and queasy and cannot breathe easily. And you can manage this by, by putting down a suction catheter and trying to get rid of some of the, the obstructing mucus. And you can also give them supplemental oxygen. In most cases, if you do that, the child will do well. But the the problem is that that these kinds of sort of basic supportive care measures really don't necessarily exist or are very hard to access in low resource settings around the world. And so it's believed that RSV is a huge killer of small children, basically because of the absence to basic medical supportive care. So in this context, there's been a lot of interest in, in, in answering the question, what can we do to protect very small children against respiratory syncytial virus? And one of the, the leading strategies that come out of this is to vaccinate the mom against respiratory syncytial virus while she's in her third trimester of pregnancy. And in that way, the mom will generate lots of antibodies, and the antibodies will cross the placenta into the baby, and the baby will be born with some degree of protection against RSV. And so that strategy called maternal RSV vaccination has become very attractive and was what led to the development by a company in Maryland called Novavax of a, of a novel RSV vaccine that can be used safely in mothers. And so they just published in the New England Journal uh, the results of their, their phase three trial, which was hope, hoped 
to be the key leading to licensure of this vaccine. Now, I'm going to dig digress just for one moment, which is to answer the question that people are probably scratching their heads about, which is why you don't vaccinate the baby directly? Why do you have to vaccinate the mom and do it indirectly? And the, the answer comes down to a, a rather unfortunate study that was done in 1969, where a, an RSV vaccine was administered to young infants. And even though this vaccine led to uh, high concentrations of antibodies against RSV, it appeared to actually potentiate the severity of the disease and a number of these children died. And so this was a, a true vaccines disaster. And, and since that time, where it appeared that the vaccine actually accelerated the severity of the disease, there's been really no enthusiasm or appetite whatsoever for for delivering an RSV vaccine to babies. So, and, and, the, and the, the concern is that part of the, that sort of disease potentiation, you know, enhancement process is mediated by T cells. And so if you give the vaccine to the mom, the only thing that crosses the, the placenta are the antibodies. And so you don't have to worry about T cell mediated enhancement of the disease. And you could do this much more safely. So that's, that's the theory. So to test this theory, the company conducted a, a, a very large and, I have to say, complicated randomized controlled trial in 87 countries around the world. And it was a straightforward comparison of, of the vaccine, a single dose to the mom in the third trimester, uh, ideally administered after 31 weeks of pregnancy, versus a, a saline placebo control. And the study's primary endpoint was uh, defined as medically significant RSV disease within the first 90 days after birth. Okay, now medically significant is a very important concept here because it is, try as one might, kind of a, a you know a, a subjective call as to what classifies as medically mm -hmm. significant. So you can you can define all the cr criteria, but each of those still comes down to a judgment call by some clinician somewhere as to whether the child has met them. And so this this as we'll see turned out to be a bit of a problem for the study. And then the second secondary endpoints were RSV associated severe hypoxemia in, in the first 90 days, which is a very categorical endpoint, but is presumably a much rarer endpoint. So it might run into statistical size, statistical power issues. And the third one was RSV associated hospitalizations in the first 90 days, which is again, a very categorical and unambiguous endpoint and might actually be fairly common. So, so they ran this trial uh, at 87 countries, though I have to say that's somewhat misleading because 75% of the data came from two countries, South Africa, which contributed half of the data, and the United States, which, which uh, contributed about a quarter of the data. And then the other 25% were the other 85 countries combined. So two very high volume sites and then 85 presumably very low volume sites. The trial ran for, for three years. It had excellent follow-up and low rates of uh, loss to follow-up uh, or withdrawal. They had very high capture rates of their, their population and their baseline demographics in their table one were extremely well balanced, suggesting that the basic mechanics of the study were, were effective. So this was a, a tightly run ship, shall we say. But they did run into one problem earlier on, which is in that their sample size calculations called for around 8,000 babies to be enrolled, and they were ultimately able, able to enroll only about 4,600. And so they started with a, a couple weights around their ankles as they were beginning to race. Now, when you get to the, the results of the study, this is where things get a little bit complex and, and I have to say a little bit political. Now, to sort of summarize the problem, I feel like the, the, the company was pitched two balls that were kind of foul balls, shall we say, but they also made, I think, an internal decision, which turned out in hindsight to have been a bit of an error, and their regulator made things rather difficult for them. So let me... Good. You're going to have to explain all those. Each of these, right. So I'll get past the metaphor. The two bad bounces of the ball to them were, one, that they were unable to get to their sample size. So they were about two or 3,000 kids short of where they had hoped to be. And so that was a a challenge, shall we say, in terms of getting to statistical significance. The second one is that the, the predicted event rate of 4% having medically significant RSV disease was not met, and they, they actually had closer to 1.5% to 2.5% severe medically significant RSV events. And so those two sort of you know, real-world results as opposed to anticipated results both sort of led to some challenges in terms of the statistical endpoint, getting to their statistically significant endpoint. The, the third one, which was, a, a, I think, a, an, an error on the company's side, was that they, their primary endpoint was this medically significant 
RSV disease, which, if I said as said before, is somewhat subjective. The problem with subjectivity is that it leads to misclassification, and as we all know from Epi 101, when you have random misclassification, it biases to the null, and so it is l more difficult, therefore, with a, a woolly endpoint to achieve a statistically significant result than with a very categorical endpoint. And then the fourth one, which was that for reasons that they don't specify in the paper, the the FDA instead of asking for you know a a, a target effect size with 95% confidence on it, the FDA asked for 97.52% confidence, meaning that they set the limbo bar extremely low for the company to crawl underneath. And that quartet of blows against the, against the statistical power of the study led them to miss their primary endpoint of medically significant RSV disease. So I have to say that this was a problem for the company because when you miss your primary endpoint specified by the FDA, now you're really in a pickle in terms of getting to licensure. You can, you can argue all you want about how it could have been and look at our secondaries and et cetera, et cetera. And if we hadn't been at 97.52%, maybe we would have made it, maybe so. But the fact is you didn't meet it. And so now the, con the, the company is really in a, in a pickle. And, and, it, and it's a pity because the, the other endpoints, they, they actually the vaccine appeared to be quite efficacious. This, you know, in particular, the, the endpoint of, of RSV-associated hospitalization was cut in about half and was highly statistically significant. So the, the vaccine worked, by golly. But they, they, they set up the, the experiment in a way that allowed them to fail despite success. And that's the tricky part, and, the, and I think also the very interesting part about this, this study. And I'll stop there. So interesting, Chris. I don't know that I picked up on exactly the same things that you did. And I'm, I'm just curious. So when I read the part about the 97.5 confidence interval, although it looked to be 97.52% confidence interval. Yeah. I mean, that is really specific. But my my sense on that was, and, and I could be totally wrong on this, this is just how I interpret it, was not that, that they were setting the bar particularly uh, any different, but so much as they were only considering a one-sided confidence interval and, you know, essentially like a, almost like a non-inferiority trial. And therefore you, you, you put all your alpha on one side, but I'm not sure I'm right about that. So that I'm just flagging that as something I didn't, I didn't totally follow, but I interpreted it a little bit different than you. But I, everything else, you know, would agree that it seems like what they did here was they ran a very complicated trial. They certainly had some issues in trying to be able to get their sample size. There does appear to be some signal going on here in that, you know, it looked like there was uh, about a vaccine efficacy of about 50% for hypoxemia and 44% for lower respiratory tract infection. The first one not being significant, the second one being significant, although, again, I don't know if that's a 95% confidence interval or, or what exactly. I think the only one that was held to that standard of 97.52 was the primary aim. Okay. And you're quite right about the second, the, uh, the hypoxemic result didn't reach significance either, but, but the event rate was quite low. So they, they just, you know, they were, I think there was simply too few, you know, not enough data to, yep. to drag the p-value into significance. And, and in terms of that, that medically significant lower respiratory tract infection rate, it was 1.5% in the vaccine group, 2.4% in the placebo group. So that would be, you know, as you say, uh, like a 40% reduction, which would be, you know, potentially be be meaningful and and important if it were you know if it were found to be true but it didn't reach that statistical significance which as you say matters a lot when you're trying to get something through the the fda yeah and don, can i before you go on to don can, yeah. can, I, can i just point out that that they missed that endpoint by a whisker the confidence in roles went from 63.7 on the on the plus side to minus one on the bottom side so yeah. close, but no cigar. Yeah, and that's where you know you do have to wonder what we, whether we put too much emphasis. I, you already know my opinion on whether we put too much emphasis on statistical significance, even in the cases of, of you know regulating things through the FDA. But Don, so Don, what's your what's your take on this study? You know, it's it's. Uh, I, I don't mean to keep coming back to COVID, but I think it's a, it's a really illustrative example of the, the issues that come up in vaccine trials. And, and I, I, I keep thinking about how a scenario like this is, is going to be a, applied to this race to develop a COVID vaccine, where the way those vaccine trials are run, they essentially start out with 30,000 individuals, 
15,000 in each arm. And they build those numbers based on an expected event rate. And that event rate is the number of severe pneumonia due to COVID or severe disease due to COVID in the placebo arm. And as with prior trials, and I don't understand why the authors in this trial or the company in this trial didn't do the same, but in prior vaccine trials, if you don't hit the events that you need in order to be able to show futility or efficacy as you're conducting the trial, you enroll more people. And you increase it from 30,000 to 40,000 to 70,000 to 80,000 until you finally get either, you know, an, uh, a, a, an efficacy signal or you realize that it's just absolutely futile. The, the two event rates are so similar in, in both arms. There's a lot of money that goes into these trials and, and to, to developing the vaccines and then to test them in the field. And I, I, part of me kind of wonders if if these guys were away from establishing efficacy in their medically important outcome by a whisker, as you say, Chris, why did they fall short? I mean, why did they cut the, 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 the study off at 4,000? Do you think it was a DSMB that said it's futile? There's no way you're going to be able to achieve this? Uh, they didn't mention that in the, in, the, in the paper. Why wouldn't they, with that investment, with that sunk cost, why wouldn't they just enroll another five or 10,000? Well, three or five thousand in this I, case. I would be surprised if if they, you know, if, if that's the way this went down. That the DSMB said, you know, you're you're you're, you're at futility because the DSMB can read the confidence rules as, as well as we can and can see, you know, that they're so close to the margin that really it, it is just a matter of like narrowing the precision by like as you say a couple thousand more subjects. I think I think more likely that they didn't do that. That they didn't have a stopping rule based around on 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 that criteria, but instead they you know they ran out of money. That that was the the rate limiting factor here is that you you know you've sunk eight I, I, I happen to know that the Gates Foundation put eighty seven million dollars into this. This is even a lot there's a lot of money for the Gates Foundation, even them. And the problem oh, with RSV see. studies is that that you know RSV is a seasonal disease, and so you can only run the study during the RSV season. So adding on another tranche of patients would have actually been incredibly expensive. Because you have to wait basically another year before you can start enrolling and keep all those eighty seven sites on the line to do that. Yeah, so I see. I had assumed that that it was the company that had put a, the the majority of the money, and you know, at that point, enrolling for yet another season probably would not have occurred a whole lot of extra costs, given in comparison to the amount of money that they have already put into developing the vaccine. Yeah, to my knowledge, Novavax doesn't have any licensed product, so they don't have any revenue. All right, they're a they're a VC funded or Gates funded organization until they until they you know they finally get something in the win column and. Um, I don't think they have the resources to keep burning like that. I can't imagine it would, it would be all that much money to continue for yet one more RSV season. But yeah, that's what they chose to do. That's what they chose to do. So it was, a, like you say, a, a sort of a fascinating example of, of why it's so important to choose your endpoint wisely. Uh, and I, I don't I want to say like they did this unwisely, but like the importance of the endpoint, you know, where they were dealing with you know, success or failure based on the on really a flip of a couple of percentage points, that that having an endpoint that was slightly less precise than one might have wanted pr- could possibly have made all the difference here in terms of being able to say we got it versus sort of sheepishly arguing for why they should have got it. Yeah, I, I hear you, Chris, although, I mean, they did plan to enroll 8,600 pregnant women and and didn't so I don't know whether or not it was really the outcome that was the issue. Although obviously I, I accept your premise that if they had something that was was easier, you know, a harder endpoint might have reduced the sample size that they needed. But it seems like they had a plan in place and they just were not able to to get to where they needed to. And I again, you know, I agree with with you guys that because there's nothing in there that says the DSMB stopped this. My assumption is that this was stopped because they ran out of ran out of money. I suspect that's what happened. It would be interesting to talk to Shabir when we when we run into him next and see if we can get the inside scoop. So what do you do with this information then? I mean, they didn't reach statistical significance for their primary endpoint, but as you pointed out, they were really close and they were certainly underpowered given that they were not able to recruit their full sample size. What I mean, what do you do with this information and what's your take on the way that they presented the information given that they didn't achieve significance. Don, what's what's your reaction to that? Oh boy. You know, I I I didn't I didn't get a real sense from the way they presented these data that 
that they were they were they were pushing one narrative ahead versus another narrative. It, it, you know, it seemed to be a you know a a fairly straightforward description of of what they came up with. Although they do say the results with the respect to the primary endpoint did not meet pre-specified criteria. However, the results with respect to the other endpoints of RSV associated and all-cause respiratory disease suggested potential benefits of maternal RSV vaccination that warrant further study of the strategy. That's the last sentence of the paper. Yeah. So, you know, they're they're sort of leaving the door ajar for additional, you know, sort of learning from their mistakes and maybe doing additional studies that could be more feasible or done more cheaply. So, so I guess my question, though, is, I mean, they've sunk a massive amount of money into this and come away with sort of uh, a mixed result in a sense that, that it is not easy to interpret exactly what's going on. And it's hard to it would be hard to get this approved by the FDA because they didn't, as you say, meet their pre-specified endpoint. On the other hand, are we really going to throw away if Chris, if that number is right, eighty seven million dollars worth of, of research that is that is certainly pointing in the direction that there might be some benefit just because they didn't they were not able to continue with the study i mean that just that just strikes me as crazy chris whoa. does it it just seems like such a an example of being so beholden to the pre-specified rules of how you declare a win or a loss in a trial that we're, we're in a sense walking away from common sense here where you know the preponderance of the evidence in this in this paper is that the vaccine is actually quite an efficacious vaccine. So, you know, and, and we, can, we can also see the origins of how this went, went wrong in terms of the sample size and, you know, you know the, the lower than expected event rates and all of those things that, that clearly had an impact. And yet even so, the vaccine, you know, achieved nearly 50% efficacy against this, uh, against this terribly deadly disease that the WHO has, has acknowledged is a huge priority for deployment of a new global vaccine. I guess I, I find myself incredibly frustrated that, you know, because of these sort of, you know, study conduct problems in terms of, of achieving the sample size and the event rate, which is, of course, beyond their their control. You know, you have a good year of RSV or where there's very little transmission, and then there are really bad years where there's lots of transmission. You can't schedule that. So some of this is sort of out of their control. And, you know, Putting it all together, we're left with what, on the face of it, it seems to be actually a quite efficacious vaccine, which may not get licensed because we failed to meet by a whisker this, you know, endpoint that was somewhat, I have to say, subjective and and therefore woolly. And I, I find that incredibly frustrating because it, because in, in my heart of hearts, I think the the vaccine actually proved itself. You know, I wonder whether it raises an issue that is in part related to what you, what you went over, Chris, either last week or next week. I'm not sure when it's going to when it's going to play, but the, the, your description of this frequent testing by that uh, being espoused by Michael Mina and how part of the barrier, which we didn't go into it at, at that point, but was that part of the barrier is that the FDA is so stringent in terms of uh, providing emergency use authorizations for tests that have to reach a certain level of sensitivity, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't approve them. And, and, and in the case of that frequent testing with a test that is not as sensitive as PCR, there's a greater good, but the, but the FDA is thinking only in terms of specific criteria for a test being used in a hospital setting or in a healthcare setting. And they're having great difficulty kind of loosening those, those, those stringent criteria. You can make the argument that the same thing applies here. On the one hand, I want the FDA to be really, really rigorous and really stringent because that's the, the, the best safeguard for our safety. But on the other hand, there may be instances like with the MENA test or with this particular findings for this particular study where it does make sense to be a little bit less rigorous and stringent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I guess my question is, you know, this seems uh, given that it was eighty seven million dollars, and I'm I'm saying that repeating it, I don't know if that's true, but you know, it's a, a massive amount of money to do this study. There isn't going to be another one, and so if you are left right now with having to bet on whether or not you think this works, what are you gonna what are you gonna do? I mean, I I will say for me, like Chris, I'm gonna bet that it that it's not you know it's not a 
panacea, but that there is some efficacy to this. And I would hate to see that we throw out a huge investment of time, money, and an investment in generating evidence just because it didn't end up you know, meeting the, the criteria that we would have wanted it to, particularly when we, we, we believe that the major reason for that is because we just couldn't get enough people. Yeah. Let, me, let me also put a plug in for Chris, because what, uh, what Chris is running a Gates-funded study in Zambia, where he's actually looking at the uh, burden of disease due to RSV among children who die in the community and finding that, in fact, there are a fair number of kids who die in the community, likely due to RSV, and that the global burden of disease in terms of the morbidity and mortality associated with RSV, especially in developing countries, is probably an underestimate. And therefore, that underscores how important this is and how, how important get, having a, a good RSV vaccine is to keep kids out of the hospital and certainly to keep them from dying. Yeah. So last thing I want to raise, and I, I mean, those are really important points. The last thing I want to raise is, you know, Chris, you pointed out that that half of the people in the study were in South Africa, a quarter were from the United States. Do you think we loot something by spreading out the the study across so many different contexts? I mean, Don, you and I have been involved in studies where the the specific context where the study was done could could provide differing results. And we end up, you know, sort of averaging over all of those different contexts. You know, you wonder whether this, you know, maybe should have been uh, or, or would have been more effective if it had been a study across several sites in South Africa. Yeah, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more data on the epidemiology of RSV transmission in all of those sites. You know, when you see that number, you think, wow, this is a very... You know, this is a very uh, diverse set of research sites, and that's true, except that when you do a weighted average, in fact, it's not. It's a, it's a two-site study, U.S. and South Africa. Yeah. You know, that that's the weird sort of paradox of this. Yep. Agreed. All right. Well, let's let's leave that one there and move on to our second segment in which we want to talk about a viewpoint piece that was published in the New England, oh, sorry, it was in JAMA, and it was published by Mello, Green, and Sharfstein. And essentially what, what this study is, it just documents some examples, some fairly uh, public examples of cases with, in which public health officials have been harassed during COVID-19 in pretty significant ways, particularly harassed online, but uh, in some cases, you know, through doxing, through publishing of their their uh, addresses and getting death threats, there was another piece that came out in which the I believe it was the the World Health Organization or the Red Cross, I'm not sure, also documented cases of, of physical abuse of of people who were trying to implement public health protections against COVID nineteen and were being physically uh, abused. And so, you know, it strikes me that we are living in in an era in which the convergence of both a pandemic and fear and also social media and the ability to express oneself in a in a harassing or aggressive way is leading to this very toxic cocktail. And I, I you know, I don't want to go through the specifics of the harassment in 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 our discussion here so much as I want to think about, you know, what are the implications for the future of public health if public health has become so politicized that public health workers, and I would say researchers as well, I certainly know colleagues who who have been harassed, are set up to be abused such that many of them will in fact leave their posts and, and their jobs for telling the, you know, telling the truth and, 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 trying their best to save people's lives. Chris, what's your what's your reaction to all this and where do you think we go from here? Well, it just adds to my growing sense of horror. You know, th- th- we are in such unprecedented times where where we're seeing an, an absolute full out assault on the truth. And I you know, I feel like that scene from the exorcist where where uh, her head spins around in circles. It, 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 this is this is beyond crazy and and it's and it goes all the way to the CDC, apparently. I mean, I, w- I was just reading this story referred to me by my, my mother-in-law in Politico, where they talk about how the White House has been harassing the CDC and controlling the messaging, including editing and asking for changes in language in the MMWR. Yeah. You know, there was this one 
episode here where you know Michael Caputo, who's one who was uh, I guess the head of uh, HHS, is that correct? I think as an assistant, uh, right? Secretary. He's the, he's director of I think he's director of communications. Okay, so he, yes, he at was HHS. The, he was the the spokesperson for HHS had tried to release the, the halt the release of some of the CDC reports, including the report saying that hydroxychloroquine's benefits do not outside the risk. And, and that report only came out very recently because the White House had pressured for it not to be released at all. And it was only just now published. And you think, like, how can this be? Like, isn't, you know, there are physicians around the country who are prescribing this drug, hoping that it will help, and, and yet not knowing that there there is no benefit to it and only only potential harm. And, and yet that is being muzzled at the, at the top level by the White House directly. And you just think like, how, how did we get here? How do we get here? And where do we go from here? Yeah. I mean, I, I read that, that Michael Caputo has actually accused the CDC of sedition. Yep. I mean, how more outrageous can it get? You know, I, I'm 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 with you, Chris and Matt. That it, it, I, I have I've been in this business a long time. Have never seen anything close. This is an orders of magnitude more disruptive to the public health venture in this country, and it, it just makes it makes me and I think all of us just sick to our stomach. And clearly, the only way around this is to certainly vote out this administration. But then it's going to take years of damage control to to reinstill confidence into both science as well as the the public health endeavor on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that the world's population for the first time in probably 100 years really understands how important public health is. Mm. And I, 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 you know, I, I, I grasp these rays of hope. And I think that going forward, there, there may be a resurgence of sanity and em, a, a embracing of public health as, a, as, a, as an important science, as something to fund, something to, to, to get behind, something to, to listen to. And so, you know, I, I vacillate between utter despair and disgust yeah. And and hope that you know maybe maybe this will be a turnaround. But the other thing, the other thought that I had was that it's a poisonous atmosphere. A lot of public health is about behavior change, mm -hmm. and behavior change is one of the hardest things to do in the world. And it becomes enormously harder when you've got this libertarian, non-libertarian polarization of there being this large segment of the society says, don't tell me what to do, mm. even if what you're being told to do is for your benefit and your family's benefit and your neighbor's benefit. That's going to be a really steep uphill climb. Yeah, I, I think you, yes. you said it so well. I, I do wonder how much of this do you think is related to the fact that you know, science plays by a set of rules as to how we conduct ourselves and we, you know, put out our work with limitations and we, you know, aren't supposed to be going out and and being spokesmen for a particular theory. We're just supposed to present the evidence, whereas, you know, those who are in politics get to do and say whatever they want. And I wonder whether we're just fighting, you know, almost in asymmetric warfare type situation where one side is is trying its best to be a fair arbiter of facts and the other side is trying to play politics and you're you're never going to win when you're in a, a situation where you're trying to remain neutral. Mhm. Mm yeah, so I'm afraid that's true. And 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 it's also you know true that the you know the war is is asymmetric as you put it partly because one side controls the funding of the scientists. You know, there was that 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 example of that fellow who was doing all the um, the surveys for viruses in bats in Southeast Asia. Peter Dazak, Peter right, Dazak. And had his entire research portfolio like yanked, basically because they were they were trying to pin the COVID nineteen thing on him. You know, it, it seems like his funding has eventually been restored, but but you know, this is this is exactly the kind of thing that that is like beyond our capacity to manage. We can only do science if we have research, and unfortunately. You know that whole process is also being politicized now. I think I think we're in a tough place. It's it's also really hard if you know if we are so we are so wedded to facts. I mean, facts is facts are our world. That you know we 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 don't deal with anything other than 
facts, except for hypotheses and a little bit of speculation here and there. But when you're up against lies and falsehoods and 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 malfeasant twisting of of information, it's a really really hard battle to win. Right. And 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 you know, it's just we have to. We just have to get the politics out of this on on the one hand on the other hand i'm i'm also energized by the degree of activism among the scientific community that you see on social media you know the the, i have colleagues that are far more vocal about about the policy and the politics and you know fighting against misinformation and disinformation than i've ever seen before i think i think we have to a certain extent as a community come out of the closet and and you know we're we're drawing a line in the sand and saying no. This has to be about facts. Mm-hmm. This has to be about evidence. Yeah, I mean, I do think that part of you know the as you said, we are about facts. We are also about caution in the cases where we can't say something definitively, and that, right. as we know, can very easily be used against us. And and I, you know, I I hear you, Don. I I do agree that there is some cause for optimism in the way that the public health community is trying to use social media to get the the good word out there, but. You know, we are we are fighting against a, a, a real strong force that's coming in the opposite direction, and uh, oh, it, it's it's worrying. Yeah, and can anyone say climate change? Yeah, I mean, it goes go. it goes beyond. It's not just about COVID nineteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's not end on a on a downer. Let's let's move over to our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing. Chris, you want to go first this time? Sure, but I don't think I'm going to cheer anybody up. I'm going to talk oh. about COVID nineteen oh, again. I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about a, a study that came out a couple of months ago that I talked about a lot when it first came out and discussed with you, Don. This is this study at the University of of Nebraska Biocontainment Unit where they were doing all sorts of sampling of patients in their two units there to look at uh, you know, how COVID-19 managed to spread all around the room. The reason I brought this up is because you know, there's been a, a sea change in our understanding about the epidemiology of COVID-19. So you all may recall that at the beginning of this, we were, we were terribly concerned about hand-washing and fomites. And, and the hand-washing fomite emphasis has has gradually ceded ground to the re- recognition that this disease is, is is really spread mainly through aerosols and through direct droplets. And so, you know, we now know this. And so if you look at like the the action plan for my kids' schools, it's all about, you know, changing the airflow and changing the filters and not recirculating the air in the buildings and opening windows and having fans and having HEPA filters in the rooms and having the kids, you know, learn outside under tents until it gets too cold to do that. And, and, you know, of course, wearing masks and, and practicing social distancing. So, you know, much of the of the implications of the aerosol transmission have been absorbed at this point. And I think people are acting rationally. But it was not always clear that this was so. And, and the, the paper I'm, I'm going to cite here was what I thought was one of the most compelling bits of evidence about the aerosol transmission route. And so it's an article that they came out in Nature Research in their scientific report series. First author, Joseph, excuse me, Joshua Santarpia. And the paper is called Aerosol and Surface Contamination of SARS-CoV-2 Observed in Quarantine and Isolation Care. So the study was done at the University of Nebraska. And the reason it was done there was that after the Ebola panic a few years back, if anyone can remember those days with such nostalgia, the government had set up a whole series of biocontainment units around the, around the country to deal with the possible influx of Ebola patients. And, and two of these uh, units were set up at the University of Nebraska. One of them was a containment unit, a quarantine unit, if you will, for patients who had been exposed and were infected, but not uh, actually sick with SARS-CoV-2. Obviously, these units were not designed for COVID-2, but are being used for SARS-CoV-2. The second one was a hospital unit where they actually had patients who were sick with SARS-CoV-2. And what they did was to send in study workers who were, you know, wearing, uh, you know, full personal protective gear to 
do environmental sample collection of all sorts of places around these patients' rooms so that they, you know, they touched the, you know, they swabbed the, the bathroom and the toilet and the sink and, you know, the walls. And they also, you know, swabbed the rails of the patient's beds and, and you know, the bed sheets near the patient and the table and the, the cell phone that the patient used and all the sort of like the high frequency, high contact objects that were near the patient. All of those things got swabbed. And they also swabbed at a distance. So they like, you know, swabbed the, the, the you know, the window sashes and the ventilator grid openings and also the window cells. And interestingly, they swabbed underneath the patient's beds. Now, on top of doing all this swabbing stuff, several uh, on several of these collection uh, occasions, the data collector was wearing a personal air sampling device, which was designed to see if, like, are we actually also capturing aerosols in the room? Can we detect aerosol detection, not things that have, you know, been coughed and sneezed across the room, but are, are just like, you know, present in, in, uh, in, in vapor form? And they took this one step forward, further, which was to also establish high volume air samplers in the corridors outside the patient's rooms. Now, these are, are biocontainment rooms. So they're under negative pressure, which means that when you open the door, there's, a, there's an airlock system where there's an outer door and then there's an inner door. And there's negative pressure in the room. So in theory, the contents of the hall are supposed to go into the room rather than from having the vapors and things in the room going out into the hallway because the pressure pressure is in that direction. So to, to make a long story short, roughly 70% of everything they swabbed came back with COVID-2 on it, including all of the swabs from underneath the beds. Mm. That's fascinating, right? Because there is no way that a patient sitting in his, in his or her bed can sneeze and emit a blast cone of droplets and mucus and stuff that will settle under the bed. You can't get there. They'd have to like crawl under the bed and sneeze there. And yet that part of the room was equally hot with with COVID-19. And the implication is if it's there, it got there because it's in aerosols, because it's distributing wherever the air goes rather than where the blast goes. And so that really argues strongly against the prior theory that this is just being spread by, by direct contact. And even more worrisome, the air sampling uh, from the patients in the room generally tested positive. I think 70% of those were approximately were also positive. And the creepiest thing of all is that so were the samples taken in the corridor outside the patient's room, past the double doors, and despite the negative pressure room. So, like, you know, they open the door, the, uh, the inner door, and they waft in a bunch of aerosols. And they open the outer door, and they waft out a bunch of aerosols into the corridor. And that gets picked up. And so these negative pressure rooms were actually not that effective at blocking the, the, you know, making a unidirectional transit of the virus from, you know, keeping it indoors. It was actually getting out every time they opened the doors. So, it's like, this is terrible news. And, and also, clear demonstration of aerosol transmission. And in many cases, they were able to culture this stuff out of the air and to show cytopathic effect in tissue culture. So, it, it was really a, you know, a, a kind of an astonishing and stark example of how, at that time, the prevailing wisdom about the transmission of this virus was simply incorrect. Boy, that's not good news. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's it's not different from what we what we have come to know so much as it is a demonstration that it could be pervasive. Yeah, yeah. The only question I have is that I wonder. I, they didn't they didn't do um, testing for infectiousness, did they, Chris? Well, they, they did cell tissue culture, and they, and they showed several slides in the final paper that came out showing uh, cytopathic effects from a virus that had been captured off of the air filters. Okay, so it was potentially infectious. So, yeah, so it was, it was the PCR positive rates were, were very, very high, but they were also able to, sh- to demonstrate cytopathic effect in tissue culture from the yeah. air. And they, did, and they didn't say what the, what the levels were. Uh, presumably of the, of the very infectious low. virus, because I think that that would be important, because, you know, it could be that they didn't clean under the bed, and that was, you know, just RNA from, you know, the prior patient from previously. But well, I think they decontaminate everything. But but your your point's well taken. I don't know who was in the room before. Yeah, but they would have to be yeah. sneezing under the bed too. And then anyway, it's, it's it's like it's irrelevant because you don't get infected from the stuff under the bed unless you crawl under the bed, which I don't think mm-hmm. many patients in hospitals do. No. You know, I mean, I suppose you could reach down there and swipe it with your finger and say, I wonder if there's any SARS and then lick your finger. But few people are actually going to do that. So we yep, can stipulate that so. that's probably not how this went down. 
No, I don't think that would would be how it would happen. All right. Well, on that happy note, then I'm going to I'm going to go second. Then I'll give Don the last word and hopefully he can bring us all back up. But I have a question for you guys. Have (laughs) either of you ever broken up with a statistical method? Uh, No. Yeah, I think that's pretty rare. So I, I read a blog post by a guy named Adrian Barnett. This was uh, about a week ago, and the title of the blog post was Dear P-Values, It's Not Me, It's Not You, It's Everyone Else. And (laughs) this was his uh, breakup letter with P-Values. And I I won't go through the whole thing, but I just want to read you a couple of couple of bits of this. So he says, uh, for a recent observational study, I tried to limit the use of p-values in the paper. My colleagues wanted more p-values and I had to politely push back. During one team meeting, I even offered to put the p-values in if someone could accurately tell me what they meant. Silence. So he goes on to say, basically, they left, you know, he convinced them all to, to leave them out. Uh, added in some citations as to why they didn't put them in. The journal then went on to reject the paper after saying, and this was submitted to AJRCCM. Anyone know what AJRCCM is? American Journal of it's Regional clinical... Communist Control and Manifestos. I don't, don't think that is. I think it's a clinical some, clinical something journal. You can look it up. but Not, um, not communists? N- no, no, I don't think it's a communist journal. Oh. Saying that the authors, you know, basically the, the statistical letter said there should be, you know, p-values and, and formal comparisons and then They rejected the paper. So he then goes on to say, here is my pledge. Based on this latest experience and my exhaustion with dealing with p-values, I am making this pledge. There will be no p-values in any paper that I co-author in the next 12 months. If my co-authors insist on p-values, then I will take my name off the paper. I will try to get a statement in the acknowledgement like Adrian Barnett would have been an author, but it was him or the p-values. So I am, I am highly supportive of this, and uh, I think I'm going to need a, a similar statement going forward. I like that. Uh, I, so Nick found it. I, I just put the p-values next to the 95% confidence interval because I think it tells a lot more of the story. Uh, that way. Thank, thank you for, for trying to needle me there. So, Nick so, my, my, so, so my question is, how long were they going out and who got the dog? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. So Nick says it's the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. So there you go. Oh, I've heard of that journal. Oh, yeah. that's that's such a sad, sad denouement. <laughs> All right, Don, what do you got? All right, so I have an article that was published in the British Journal of Dermatology. I won't go through the authors because their names are hard to pronounce. BJD. And it is an article entitled The Pleasurability of Scratching an Itch, Ooh. a psycho, psychophysical and topographical assessment. So apparently you can induce a non-histamine associated itch by rubbing onto the skin the, the surface of a particular kind of a seed pod that is grown on the outside of a plant that's found in Africa and Asia called cowhage. Okay. And apparently and the the the, uh, the Latin name is Musuna pruriens. It is so well known for this plant for being able to produce an itch that its Latin name even contains the word pruriens, which is which means uh, itchy. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, so what they did in this in the study was to um, got. 18 healthy subjects, and they rubbed this seed case on their wrists, on their ankles, and on their backs. And then the volunteers described how itchy it felt and how uncomfortable they they were. And then the researchers proceeded to scratch those itches. (laughs) For them? (laughs) For them. In a very organized and systematic way. And then they recorded the degree on a Likert scale, the degree, the degree of pleasurability with having those three parts of their bodies scratched in the presence of these intense itches that were induced by the cowhage plant. And it turns <laughs> out that the worst place to have an itch is the middle of your back and your ankle. The forearm is not so bad. but the, uh, And the place of those three areas of the body I'm yeah, exactly. Say, it's limited only to those three areas of the body. Of those three, 
the, the area of the body that was associated with the most pleasure when the, when the itching was extinguished through scratching from a stranger it was the middle of the back. <laughs> okay. So, so many, so many questions right now. So, yet another qu- the the main question is, who cares and <laughs> who funded this? No, and why no, would you do this study? No, the main question is, who finds pleasure in a stranger scratching your back? <laughs> right. That's right. the real question. Oh God! So wow. Do we, do we know yeah. what makes it itch? Like, why is it so itchy if it's not a histamine? What's the? Uh, that's funny that you should ask because there was a paper <laughs> that I pulled called "Cowhage Evoked Itch Is Mediated by a Novel Cysteine Protease, a ligand of protease activated receptors." I will be happy to send you this paper, Chris. To, I'd like to, to see it to, qu- to quench your thirst for knowledge. <laughs> it really scratches that itch, <laughs> to doesn't it? Scratch that itch for knowledge, Chris. All right, thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Well, that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you could tweet us at PopHealthyX or tweet me at, at ProfMattFox or Chris at ID.Gill or Don at, at DThea1. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website. We want to thank Leslie Talalian, Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health, for celebrating the podcast. And Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. And we hope you will download our next episode. 